in 26. I would love to get through this whole passage today, but I think I'm only going to get through these two verses. But uh, I titled this message, The Revelator. And uh, the Revelator is the one who reveals. Um, the Bible is very clear that no one can truly know God unless God reveal himself to that person. Um, we seek him. We're separated from him. Uh, we really don't know where to find him. God's not the one that's lost. It's us that are lost. And uh, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. But if there is a need in the church of God today, it's for a fresh revelation to us of Christ, to our soul. The deep need in our churches today is for the true knowledge of God. Very often we try to fix areas of our life that are deeply going through trouble and strain, but I believe we can trace the majority of our problems to a lack of the knowledge of the true God. And the recovery of knowing God and knowing who God is has a way of taking care of those other things that we major on so much. Now, of course, recently we've been covering uh, the titles of Jesus, and you can't help talk about Jesus without also talking about the Father. And the revelator in this instance is the Father who reveals Jesus to us. And here in Matthew 11, 25, you have the very statements of Jesus himself covering and rejoicing in the reality that God has revealed himself to people who you wouldn't expect. And yet he has also hidden himself from the prideful and the arrogant and those who think they could arrive at God through their own human observation. Let's read this and then we will break into what our Lord is discussing this morning in this passage. It says, at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Now, there is a key here in this final statement, little children. If you remember that Jesus said that those who receive the kingdom must receive the kingdom as a little child. A little child has no, has no, how can you put it, presuppositions. They usually don't have pride or arrogance. They come with a genuine humbleness of soul because they are little children. There's an innocence about their approach. And God says that unless we become like little children, we will in no ways enter the kingdom of God. There have been in church history great wise men. I think of one by the name of St. Augustine who, um, who heard about God through his praying mother, Monica. How many of you know there's power in a praying mother? <laughs> and, that, and that story about Monica truly, um, or the story of Augustine, truly makes that known. If ever there was a rascally rascal, his name would, be, would have been St. Augustine. Uh, before he was the saint, you know. Um, she prayed and prayed for him. And he said that initially when he heard the gospel, um, the reason why he rejected it is because he couldn't bring his great learning with him in order to receive Christ. If, if he could arrive at the truth and knowledge of God through his great learning, then he would have received. But because he had to humble himself to receive Christ, he rejected it. And uh, because if we can arrive at God through our great learning and our great observation, then we can boast that it was our great learning and our great observation that brought us to the knowledge of God. Unless God reveal himself to us, we cannot and we will not truly know who he is. 
It's an aspect of God's grace. It's, it's going to take grace for God to make himself known to any human being. We cannot discover him through our own human observation. We can know of his existence, but none of our information around us can bring us into a real relationship with who he is. We can look at the creation around us. We can look at the great natural things around us and understand that truly there has been a great intelligence behind it all that created everything. But who is this great intelligence and who is this person who gave us existence, who brought us into planet Earth and uh, basically put us into a theater? This world is indeed a theater. And I'm going to stay away from any Shakespeare quote on that. But anyway, so Jesus is rejoicing in the reality that the Father has done two things in this passage. He is hidden, and yet he is also revealed. And very often when we look at this passage, we only look at the final part of, of the fact that he has revealed. But in order for us to really address this passage in its fullness, we must first observe the first work of the Father addressed in this passage, that by the way, Jesus is rejoicing in as well, that he has hidden these things from the wise and understanding. Jesus is rejoicing in that, as well as the revelation of the little children. So let's look at this. The Greek word is krupto. And I know you won't remember that when you leave this place, and that's all right. Maybe you will. And it basically means to cause something not to be known, to hide, to keep secret, to conceal. Do we serve a God that sometimes hides himself? Think about that. Do we serve a God that sometimes deliberately and intentionally causes himself not to be known? Yes, in certain instances that's true. The prideful person who wants to seek to, to, to find the existence of God or truly come into an, an encounter with God, God will resist the proud and the prideful. We must first humble ourselves and come and seek him in the way that he himself has prescribed if we are going to find him. There is no discovery of God truly and utterly without first there being a humbling of ourself. The, uh, the Greek culture at that time, if you remember, in uh, Athens, the great place of learning, Paul went in there and his spirit was moved, his spirit was grieved, his spirit was agitated because he looked around and he saw all these idols. He saw the temple of Zeus and the temples dedicated to Apollos and his heart was gripped and he, he, he read the altar that was dedicated to the unknown God. So for the Greeks, for all their great learning, they could not arrive at knowing who this God was. All they could come up with was the unknown God. We know God exists. We know there had to be a creator behind it all. And so they invented their own stuff. They had these different stations, these different gods that were over different aspects of creation because surely um, there couldn't be a God big enough to run it all, you know. But oh, there is. <laughs> oh, there is. So Paul got up and he addresses the crowd and he first appeals to them from their own poets who dedicated much of their poetry to the creator they did not know. In fact, there was a famous poet he quoted, in him we live and move and have our being, as well as your poet has said. Now the apostle Paul didn't stop there. He says, let me also declare to you this unknown God. And then he preached Christ to them. He preached the resurrection to them. Some believed and some rejected. The gospel reveals God to us in a way that nothing else can or nothing else ever will. 
if you have cast aside your Bible, and if you have cast aside the, 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 the revealed revelation of God's word in your quest, in your search for God, you will arrive at the same conclusion that the Greeks did, because they were a lot smarter than we were intellectually now, to the unknown God. In order for us to know who God is, we must first begin to seek him from what he has given. And if you can hold your Bible up this morning, not as a ceremony, but understand this, that this Bible declares to us the historical times in human history when God has spoken, God has made himself known. And you are not going to find God if you cast aside the Bible. You can know of his existence. You can know he, he's real. But you will not truly know him for who he really is without knowing the recorded revelation of, of the times that God has made himself known. So, the Bible is the greatest source for the truth of who God is. Imagine that. God resists the proud. Now, there's one way of translating this version in Matthew 11, going back to Matthew 11:25. Lao and Nida translate it this way, and I think it's important for us to understand who is behind this work of self-concealment. It is God himself who conceals himself from those who seek him for the wrong reasons. He says, because you have, the, the, the way that they translate it is because you have kept the wise and learned people from knowing and have caused the unlearned to know. God is behind this action just as much as he's behind the revelatory action of making himself known. Job puts it this way. Well, not Job, but the book of Job, Elihu, in the book of Job. He says, therefore men fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. In other words, if we seek God from our own conceits, we will not find him. Think about this. The human heart, even in its fallen state, is very clever. It's very intelligent, isn't it? If you want to know how intelligent, uh, how, how intelligent human beings are, Look at all the reasons man has tried to come up with for the, for the excuse that God doesn't exist. Think about that. Very elaborate arguments, right? <laughs> Look at the pro-abortion arguments that people come up with. This is my body. I have a right to do this. And they stir people up emotionally. And then people object, yeah, this is my body. And yes, I can kill this child. It's still a child. Regardless of how you look at it. And most of the arguments against God and against that which is right or that which is wrong are built up on sheer emotion and they, they, they invent these other aspects of argument. But if man is made in the image of God, that baby you are destroying in your womb, you are destroying the image of God. You say, well, I was raped and I'm bearing this child because I was raped. Well, that child in your womb is still innocent, regardless. My Twitter feed has gone down since I've been saying this kind of stuff on my Twitter, but that's okay. We must, you see, we as believers, we must determine what's right and wrong from Scripture itself. Scripture must be our final judgment, our final litmus test of what's right and what's wrong, not our emotional argumentations. Scripture itself should be the deciding factor. Now, Scripture is very clear that man has a deep problem, and that problem is sin. That problem is we've all been born under sin, under the effects of sin, and in that sense, even though we have been made in God's image, we are void of God's presence in our life, and this is why we must be born again. We've been made in the image of God, and even in our fallen state, what man has achieved even in his fallen state is incredible, astounding, the intelligence that human beings have. 
But it's like we're tapping into God's image without giving God any of the credit, any of the glory for giving us this image. Think about it. The only hope for man is to be recovered by the God who created him. God's put an image in us. It's fallen. It's tarnished. It's marred by sin. But the image is still there. So there remains something in the human soul, in the human heart that longs for something. And that seeks something that we do not yet have. And if you were like me, I sought these things in all other issues. I thought that if I could find the greatest pleasure, that would satisfy my human soul. I went from pleasure to pleasure to pleasure, and the more I dabbled in the pleasure, the more empty I came out of that pleasure, realizing that, wow, what is it? And I can remember when God came into my life, I can remember saying in my mind, you mean the answer has been God the whole time? You mean it's God? And I, you know, if I can be transparent with you this morning, the biggest obstacle for me was religion. It wasn't God so much, it was religion. It got in the way. Um, I thought that if I came to God, I had to become a priest or something. And God bless you. Well, we are a priest in the truest sense of the word now. But I thought God was a killjoy, you know? No, God just wanted to deliver me from the sin that was killing me. God is love. And it's truly been coined that when you're crying for love, you're crying for God. If only you knew it. Talking to a young man one day, he told me what he thought of God, and he told me his description of who he thought God was. And I told him, I said, you know... If your definition of God was real, I would reject that God as well. But they said, you've got the wrong understanding of who God is because you have built this all up from your own hatred, your own sin, your own rebellion, and your whole definition of who God is is completely messed up. God is love. And even now, as you are blaspheming his name, guess what? He still loves you. That's the amazing thing about this God. But the condition of human beings is the problem here in our quest for God. The problem isn't with God. The problem is with human beings. Now let's go here to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now let's look at context here in this verse as I describe it to you. Um, this is talking about someone who is unsaved. This is talking about someone who has never been born again. We'll read it and then we'll talk about it because I want to talk about how I've even heard this verse taken out of context. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Some of you are still going the old-fashioned way. I hear pages rustling, so I'll let you get there. And I like the fact that you bring your Bible to church. Keep doing that because then we just might read it more. Amen. The natural person, that's, that would be you and me before we knew Christ, before we knew God, before we were saved, before we were born again. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Impossible. They're not going to accept it because, number one, they're natural. They're not spiritual. They've not been made alive in the Spirit yet. They've not been born again by the Spirit of God. We are void of it. Um, we do not accept. It's a for they are folly to him. And notice that not only does he not uh, accept, it goes on to say he is not able. See that? We lack the ability. We lack that inner ability to comprehend God. He is not able to understand them. Because they are spiritually discerned. They must be spiritually evaluated for us to understand and receive them. The New American, I like the New American standard because it says they must be spiritually appraised. Like appraising the true value of a house. Considering its true worth. The way I've heard this passage 
declared in the church, which is wrong, is, you know, in the church of God, you've got the carnal believers and then you've got the spiritual believers. Maybe you've heard it presented this way. And boy, if you only had the gift I had, you could understand God more. How many of you know that's a misuse and an abuse of this text? Every believer has the ability to know and understand God. And usually, what I found in my life, people who translate this verse that way or interpret it that way, they're the ones who are claiming to hear from God 24-7, you know. They're just hearing God all the time. And your temptation when you hear it presented to you in that light is, what's wrong with me? It's like, okay, they're hearing from God and they must be right. And, you know, usually we take the humble route when we... Uh, brought up our scriptures brought up against us and like if you only had what i had you know if you only had this gift if you only had that gift if you only had this extra boost then you would know god better any teaching that cheapens the new birth and lessens the new birth is a bad teaching the greatest miracle that could ever happen in your human soul is the regeneration and by golly there's many feelings after that amen many feelings don't limit him to one there's many hallelujah uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness jesus said for they shall be filled and if you're hungry and thirsty he will fill you there's really only one new birth and many fillings after that and we confuse the issue when it comes to the holy spirit by making these these designated issues and we confuse things and uh, we make it about particular spiritual gifts. And then uh, people take these teachings. And then they'll take the... One, one of the favorites is the parable of the ten virgins. And it's like, of all the passages we should not be building doctrine on, it ought, to be, it, it ought not to be the parable of the ten virgins. <laughs> That's a difficult passage, amen? <laughs> um, the, the five that were rejected never had oil in the first place you know and um but anyway if you are born again this morning and you have been born again by the spirit of god you have been given the ability from god to know who he is the problem is very often we are in ministries that are not preaching God's word. Therefore, we don't know who God is because God's word is the channel for which the Holy Spirit operates. So we major on the word. I can't reveal God to you. I can just submit the word of God to you. It's the Holy Spirit that makes God known to you. But make no mistake, the Holy Spirit uses the scriptures to make God known. This is why we major on the Word. Because this is what the Holy Spirit uses. And if you've been born of God, God has put within you an ability to know who He is, a desire to know who He is, and a desire to pursue Him and know Him more accurately and more correctly. Think about what Jesus said. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will do what? He will lead you and guide you into all what? truth for he will not speak on his own initiative but he'll make known to you that which 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 i have said and that which i have declared jesus said he'll take of mine and he will show them unto you there will be indeed an explosion a wonderful explosion in the soul of any person that's been born of God because the Holy Spirit comes with a desire to make Christ known to you in a deeper way and in a deeper measure. Amen? Now, we have a tension in Scripture here because um, if you turn with me to Isaiah 65 verse 1, we will discover that no human being on their own seems to seek God without God first seeking them. If you were like me, the first 18 years of my life, I didn't seek God. I got up every morning. I watched the sun go up, the sun go down. Um, I could enjoy my food, eat and breathe, look at, look at uh, beautiful scenery and admire it, look at artistry and say how wonderful it is without ever once thinking about who made it? Who created it? Without ever once giving God the glory 
Oh, but there was a turn in my life. And that turn was instigated by God, not by me. This took place, Isaiah 65, verse 1. I permitted myself. Who, who's, who's speaking here? God. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. Did we ask for God? I don't remember asking for God. But you know what I came to discover? He was asking for me. We may be surprised the people who Jesus asks for. There was one man, the thief on the cross, if you remember. And all he could say to Jesus, recognizing Jesus wasn't just any old man here. He's dying in an extraordinary way. All he could say is, Lord, remember me. And you know what Jesus did? He claimed him. He said, I tell you the truth, this day you will be with me in paradise. The other man next to the other thief died cursing and probably went into hell cursing. But the other man was spared and saved. Think about that. Free men on the cross, representative of the whole humanity. You got one in the middle who's giving life. You've got one who's losing his life for all eternity. But you've got, you've got the other who's receiving. Those three men represent all humanity. What are we going to do with the one who was nailed to that cross? He's giving life. Are you going to receive it or are you going to reject it? That will determine where you will spend eternity and I will spend eternity also. Those who did not ask for me, I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I didn't seek him for the first 18 years of my life. I did not ask for him for the first 18 years of my life. Looking back now, I see that the Bible says that I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I, I was living, but I was dead in the spirit. I wasn't alive to God. God created me to know him, but I did not know who he was. I lived separated from him for the first 18 years of my life until he began to knock on my door and say, it's time, it's time for this young man to come into my kingdom. Oh, I tried to resist. I tried to resist the call of God. How many of you have ever tried to resist the call of God? I think every hand would go up. It's a rhetorical question, I guess. But oh, I could not resist. I wanted to resist, but I could not resist. Does that make sense? I wanted to, but I could not. I could not even though I wanted to, and his love began to draw me, his, his love began to compel me. Scripture says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. But make no mistake, kindness is not some weak, flimsy thing. At the back of God's kindness is his power, his omnipotence. When he wants you, he's going to get you. Amen? <laughs> it's your choice whether you want to come the easy way or the hard way. Make your pick, but come. And usually we choose the hard way if we're honest. Now notice this. I said, here am I. Here am I. This is a self-disclosure of God to a human being. Here am I. Here am I to a nation which did not call on my name. Can I put it this way? God said, here am I. And then guess what? I called on his name. I sought him. I asked for him, but I did not ask for him. I did not seek him. I did not call on his name until he said, here am I. Here am I. And I think he says it twice here because we're so dead, we're so blinded, we're so stubborn, we're so lost that he says this twice. You might say, what about the person who's never heard the gospel? What about the person who's never heard Christ? You know, it's a tragedy today that there are people on planet Earth who are still yet to hear the gospel. Could there be people in America who have never yet heard the gospel? Think about it this way. It's possible. But notice that even to this people, my, my first 18 years of my life, however long it took you to come to Christ, or if you're not with Christ yet, notice this, 
that, that we're surrounded by evidence of God's existence, yet not one single one of us bother to seek this God who's behind this marvelous creation that he's put us in. It says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. There is enough evidence out there for God's existence. Then if that's the case, then why does no human being seek him? It's because we're sinful. It's because we're, we're dead in trespasses and sins. And God must begin to awaken us. Can we say this? That prior to new birth, there is a work of God's Holy Spirit that is necessary. And it's called the work of conviction. Where he begins to wake you up to the realities. You'll find that. I'm not going to turn to it today. But you'll find that in John 16 verse 8. And Jesus talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when he's come, he'll convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he describes why he does those three things. So make no mistake, the true activity of the Holy Spirit will always seem to first of all bring conviction and then repentance and then life. We have been praying for a revival for the church of God. We're praying for a revival in our own soul we're praying for a revival in this church, but make no mistake, there will be no true revival without there being pro, uh, prior conviction of sin and conviction that brings us to repentance. Um, one of the problems we've had over the years with some of the uh, claimed moves of God, we have to look and we say, where is the conviction where is the repentance? Where is the love and hunger for God's truth, God's word? We're claiming this is the spirit, but people have cast aside their Bibles. People aren't seeking him. People aren't truly hungering and thirsting after holiness, something that is foreign to the human heart until the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, we have been given direction on how we are to seek God. Do you know that in the Bible? Do you know that God gave us direction? And the direction he gave to us is basically, if you do it this way, then you'll find me. Think about it. Jeremiah 29, 13. Let's go there. So God makes this promise to us. You will seek me and find me. Isn't that a great promise? You will seek me and find me. Wow. Great. But notice the condition. Now, I've got to say, I don't know anyone that's going to meet this condition without God first working it in the human heart. When God says, here I am, here I am to a human being, guess what? It produces something in you that was not there before. And it's the condition that's laid down in this passage. When you search for me with all your heart. Isn't that awesome? Even in our religiosity, sometimes as Christians, we fail to do this. It's like we go through the motions get our Bibles out, go to church, wait till next week, repeat the process, but our hearts aren't in it. If we're honest, and the thing that God is after, he, he knows we're not perfect, but he wants honesty from us, transparency from us. If we're not doing this wholeheartedly, we need to fess up and let him know, God, I'm not doing this wholeheartedly. Would you reignite my soul? Would you renew my first love? Would you restore my first love? Would you restore my passion for you, my longing for your word? Would you um, bring me back to that first love again? We all go through that. I think every single believer goes through that. But our greatest moments on planet Earth as believers have been when we have searched for him with all our heart, hasn't it?
And usually what's produced that searching has been a crisis. It's been a difficulty. It's been a sin that you're trying to overcome, perhaps. It's been a struggling marriage. It's been battles with our children. Whatever it is, you realize, God, I cannot change this on my own. I need you. And you begin to seek him, and God uses that whole trial for good because now you're reading your Bible like you never did before. You're praying like you never did before. It's actually wholehearted. It's got some heart in it. Hallelujah. Oh, my friend. God has said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Isn't that awesome? How can a heart that previously did not even consider God, did not seek God, suddenly be transformed to seek him with a whole heart? That, my friend, is supernatural. That's a work of God in the human soul. If you were like me, when I first started seeking God, I was just seeking him for, if you pardon the expression, fire insurance. I didn't, I didn't want complete coverage. Does that make sense? I hate to speak in those terms, but very often as human beings, we're like, well, I want to be saved from hell. Now, that's a good start. I've got to say, to be saved from hell is a good thing. Amen? But that's not the only reason why we should seek the Lord. Now, what is it that changes? I've I got to be honest with you. Scripture says we love him because he first loved us. It's when God loves on you and God loves you at your worst condition. It's like the song that Dallas Holmes sings, At my worst you found me, at my worst you came. How could you love me, Jesus? I'll never know. It's at our worst that he loved us, not at our best. We get this thing turned around. Sometimes in religion we say, well, I'll clean myself up first and then I'll come to God. No, it won't happen. Come as you are. Come in your unworthiness, come in your sin, and bring it to Jesus because you cannot clean yourself up. So anyway, I came to God for fire insurance. And guess what? He loved me and gave me the full coverage. It was incredible. Scripture says love covers a multitude of sin. I, was, I felt like I was nothing but sin. You peel the layers of an onion, and the more I peeled, the worse it got, even to the central core. It was just sin. Even the things I thought, but this is good. No, it's not. It was tainted with self-centeredness. And I realized for a brief moment, I was in this spiritual straitjacket, just doing normal things. I can't do that. That's sin. I can't do that. That's sin. And I was trapped in my sin. But you know what bust that loose was the love of God. God came in, loved this sinner, loved me at my worst, and that set me free. And I realized, God, if you could love me at my worst, then how much more now will you love me? Now I'm a child of God. But there's two parts to this scripture in Matthew 11:25. Let's go back to the text briefly. I won't spend as much time on the second part. That's when you can say amen. 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 You have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. That's the first part. And revealed them to little children. That's the second part. That's the best part. Amen. God has revealed this to little children. Do you know what turns us into little children? It's Holy Ghost conviction. Think about it. Holy Ghost conviction is preparation for your heart to receive God's truth. You realize, yep, I'm a sinner. Yep, I don't have any righteousness of my own. Yep, there's a judgment to come. Oh boy, am I in trouble. It might be a little different for you than it was for me. But that's the way it worked for me. I've never seen hell, but I was convinced of the reality of hell. And I look back and I think... How come I was convinced of a place I'd never seen? It had to be a work of the Holy Spirit in my soul. Convincing me, this is where you're going. And prompting me to cry out for fire insurance. Oh, but God is interested in more than fire insurance. We should rejoice eternally for being delivered from the second death. 
We should thank God that shout in ground, but that's not all of salvation. It's not what we are delivered from just. It's also what we've been delivered unto, brought into. As one preacher said, you, you offer them Christ, and if they reject Christ, you leave them in the hands of Moses. I remember in my early days, how many of you remember your early days as a Christian? So much zeal, but not much knowledge. I had the wonderful tract, the grace tract in my front pocket, and I had the hell tract in my back pocket, which I used under emergency. And I'm standing at the door. Now, this, this, this tract was so bad, it had flames on it. And I thought, this will get it. I'm, I'm preaching to one person, he's, he's resisting it. And he tells me he's a certain type of sinner. And at that time, you know, I thought, well, certain types of sinners, they just need to be dangled over the coals, you know. So I gave him the gospel. He rejected it. So then I produced a hellfire truck. Take this. I don't think I did it in love. I know, all honesty, I don't think I did it in love at all. I was like, I was like a, a tiny Jonah despising the person I'm preaching to. But may God still use it for his glory. Amen. But there's two aspects to this message. Hell is real. The gospel is real also. And the gospel is our only way out. You have revealed them unto little children. Now, two, two contrasts here. You've got God who conceals, or the Father who conceals, and then the Father who reveals. But then you've got two contrasting persons. You've got the wise and understanding and then you've got little children. The difference between wise and understanding and little children is little children are very teachable. Think about it. Very teachable. And we need to be teachable in these days. To become teachable is to receive the word with meekness. Receive with meekness or gentleness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Do we realize that the word of God has salvation power in it? The problem is our receiving of it. We need to humble ourselves, become gentle and submissive to the word of God. Not to me, but to the word of God. And check out what I say because I'm just a human being. If what I'm saying to you today cannot be supported with chapter and verse, then you reject what I'm saying to you this morning. But if, if it can be backed up with chapter and verse, then you better receive it, not because I'm saying it, but because God's Word says it. Don't let the paper plate get in your way, amen? Eat the food on the plate, not the plate itself. Anyway, the Greek word here is apocalypto, and it's from... Um, the same word here, uh, to cover, conceal, but it means to remove a veil or covering, exposing to open view what was before hidden, to make manifest or reveal a thing previously secret or unknown. Now there's another passage here. It's the Father that reveals Jesus to us. Matthew 16, 17. We'll just point that out real quick here. And Jesus answered him, uh, Peter, that is, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. This is where he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who do you say that I am? Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. The source of revelation is never flesh and blood, ever. Whether it be the preacher preaching it, or whether it be you studying your Bible, and coming to that realization, you are not the source of that revelation. I am not the source of that revelation. The Father is. And this is what Jesus is saying. Peter, it wasn't you. It was my Father who is in heaven that revealed this to you. Now, Matthew eleven twenty six. 26. How many of you have an English Standard Version this morning? Nobody? Oh, good. There's, there's three of us that have an English standard. <laughs> good, lots of good versions out there and some that should be avoided, of course. Um, I love the ESV translation here because it brings out the graciousness of this revelation. Think about it. 
if you cannot arrive at this through your own flesh and blood, it must be given, right? It has to be given. If you can't come to this realization on your own, then surely grace has to be, has to be the vehicle behind the revelation. It seemed good in your sight. This is your good pleasure. Uh, but the ESV says, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Isn't that amazing? It was God's grace behind the revelation of Christ to your soul, which connects Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? Now, I wrap up this message here, begin to wrap up this message with an exhortation that if all these things are the case that I've been describing to you this morning, then I, I, I want to finish with an exhortation. My appeal to you this morning is if this is the case, then my appeal to you is from Isaiah 55, verse 6, that this is the Lord's ex exhortation to your soul, to my soul, because now is the time of great opportunity. Now is the day of salvation, it says in another part of Scripture. Now. Now is the time that we must believe, which would indicate that there's coming a time when salvation will no longer be available. Think about that. I don't know when that time is. It's different for each person. But once you die, that's it. The decision's been made. There's no second opportunity after death. That's it. You, you know, whatever we determined here on planet Earth, that will be your eternal destiny. And here's the problem we have. You do not know your last day on Earth. Neither do I. If you drive with me, you might come to think it could be your last day on earth. Just to let you know how fragile life is. My father-in-law has gotten stronger faith in these days. Having me driving through Salt Lake City to the um, hospital. You know, I'm so used to driving in Wyoming. Anyone else have a problem when you go to a city? You're still in that Wyoming mode. Da, 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 da. Classy. <laughs> and he's like, don't do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they got brakes. They're okay. They can see me. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure that some of those people, they see Wyoming plates and they're like, no, no. Here they come. They, they kind of give you extra room because that's what you need, you know, especially number four counties. But anyway, seek the Lord while he may be found. That's an exhortation to you and me. Are we going to seek him? Seek him. This is an exhortation to us. I was listening to a preacher, very convicting preacher the other day, and he said that our Twitter page and our Facebook page will be a conviction against us that we did have the time to seek him when we said we did not have the time to seek him. Think about that. How much time do we spend on that stuff? And yet we don't seek his face. Oh, Lord, I just don't have time. Man. All God's got to do is get out your phone and say, really? Hmm, interesting. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Redeeming the time because the times are evil. Make the most of your time. When you have an impression to be in God's word, get in God's word. When the phone rings and you have that impression, put the phone aside. This is my time with God. Unless it's an extreme emergency. Seek the Lord while he may be found. He may be found. Seek him. Call upon him while he is near. He is not far from any one of us this morning. He's near every one of us. Do not say, who's going to go up to heaven to get the revelation? Do not say, who is going to go down into Hades to find it? Because the word declares the word is near you, even in your heart and in your mouth, the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Think about that. Call upon him while he is near, which may indicate that there could be a time when he's no longer near. 
Now I've got to quote the final verse here that goes with it. You say, but I'm wicked. Well, you're not alone on that. The whole human race doesn't know it, but the whole human race is in on that too. <laughs> and unrighteousness. Let the wicked forsake his way. What a great opportunity we have this morning. Let the wicked forsake his way. This is God's appeal to you and me. I'm wicked. God, you don't know what I've done. Well, he does know what you've done. Think about that. <laughs> he knows. In fact, let me put it this way. You don't know the half of what you've done. But he knows what you've done. I've quoted this before when people are being negative towards you. My old friend C.H. Spurgeon when he says, do not take it to heart when people speak ill of you, for you are much worse than they think you are. Think about that. When people come against you, all you can say is, you don't know the half. Yeah, you're right. But God loves me, even in all this. And he loves you too. <laughs> Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You see, we're not going to be judged, just judged by our actions. We're going to be judged by our thoughts. And some of us know that, and we realize, wow, my actions are, seem to be pretty good, but my thoughts are bad. Well, you're not alone on that one either. Aren't you glad that when God made man, he, he didn't put speakers on our brain to broadcast our thoughts? You know, when Scripture says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, if God put speakers on my brain, you would not see me outside ever. Unless it's 2 o'clock in the morning or something, scurrying around. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Isn't that, what a wonderful appeal this is. Return to the Lord today. That he may have compassion on him and to our God. Notice this. For he will not just pardon, he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that good news? Seek him today. Wise men still seek him. Now I know we're going to close here, but I'm going to give an opportunity for prayer. We have a one song special, right guys? I'm going to call the guys and the girl out. Uh, it's good to have Butch's sister with us today and this whole family and uh and it's 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 awesome and also the other side of the family emily too awesome it's great to have you all here today uh we've been celebrating austin's graduation he's graduate yeah wake him up austin we've been celebrating your graduation these teenagers they don't seem to get enough sleep do they um but we just want to appeal to you this morning that if anyone needs prayer, Gordon and Mickey are here. They'll pray for you. And uh, Right, guys? Uh, and we love you. And the Lord is here. And if anyone needs prayer, as these guys are sharing this beautiful song with you, let the Lord draw you this morning. Whatever the need is, the Lord knows. And we love you. And so go ahead and share, guys. Thank you. Waiting on Daniel. And after this song, guys, we'll close in prayer. But uh, if anyone needs prayer right now, please feel free to come out. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life, and led me to the grave. I had no upon my helpless state.
and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I Father in heaven, we just thank you for this wonderful word that uh, was proclaimed from your, from your church today. I just pray that that word sinks deep in our hearts, in our minds, um, that you give us the strength and boldness to proclaim this truth as well to others. There's a world of lost people here, Father, and we just want to reach them for you. So just uh, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 